Well, as I said, it's uh, it's the most genetic of the neuropsychiatric conditions, and it is the way I think forward to try to understand uh, what's going on in terms of the underlying neurobiology, genetics, human genetics gives you the way in. And there are already uh, 15 or 30 genes that have been implicated uh, in autism. And to me, in there are two classes of genetic influences on complex diseases like uh, autism. There's these polymorphisms, uh, the common variants that increase your risk you know, 1.5 fold or something. Uh, and those are generally identified by these genome-wide association studies using uh, SNPs, these single nucleotide polymorphisms. They have not been that informative for the most part. There have been some recent successes, but many years of these kinds of studies have not uncovered very much. But then there's another class of rare mutations uh, that turn out to greatly increase your risk. And to me, uh, the most informative of, those, informative of those so far have been the Nurexin, Neuroligin, Shank 3 uh, mutations. And Thomas Bergeron was the first to identify uh, Neuroligin mutations in individuals with autism. So what he did was intuited that there would be abnormalities in synapses. And so he looked at two genes, neuroligin 3 and neuroligin 4, which encode proteins that work only at synapses, and sequenced the protein coding regions of those in 150 or so autistic kids and in uh, neurotypical kids, and found two Swedish families in which one had a neuroligin 3 mutation, the other had a neuroligin 4 mutation, and there were two brothers in each of these families because he looked at families that were multiplex, had two or more kids. And he found that one kid was autistic and the other brother was uh, Asperger's, so both ends of the spectrum. And that was true of the other Swedish family with a Neuroligin 4 mutation. So that was the first evidence that a mutation that affects a protein that works only at synapses can give you both ends of the spectrum. I mean, that was a huge step forward in my view. Not everybody agrees with that, but in my view, that was a major step forward. And I think it's very likely uh, that a synaptic problem will be found to be at the heart of most kids uh, with uh, autistic spectrum disorders, but who knows. But then there's another class of um, single gene defects where if you have this mutation, you get a complex neurological disorder like Rett syndrome, Fragile X, Down syndrome, so on, uh, where autism is simply part of a more complex neurological disorder, and therefore they're called syndromic forms of autism, and they're very good mouse models of those. And to me, that's the way forward. You start with a big effect mutation in a human with the disease, now you try to model that in an experimental animal like a mouse and then you do the analysis in the mouse and try to figure out which part of the brain, what cell types in the brain, which synapses, which circuits, and try to model it in the experimental animal because you have powerful tools that you don't have in humans. This, of course, has been a, an enormous public concern, uh, particularly parents or grandparents who have uh, autism in the family. Imagine you have a child. I should have said that regression is dramatic in about 30% of autistic kids. They develop apparently normally for a year and a half, and then relatively quickly, they lose what they had and become classically autistic. And then they start to recover, and some recover completely, and others don't recover at all. So you can imagine, you've got a child that's been fine, you vaccinate them, and two or three weeks later, the child's no longer looking at you or talking, and they're now autistic. Well, you're going to have a lot of trouble trying to convince that parent that this has nothing to do with the vaccination. But the fact is, there have been 10, 15 studies that show unequivocally that vaccination uh, is just not involved in this condition. So the best study, in a way, is one from Denmark, where they showed, many studies have shown this, that the vast increase, 15-fold increase in incidence, uh, occurred uh, 
I guess from 1990s onwards. Yet, the big concern about vaccination in the UK, it's MMR, mumps, measles, rubella vaccination. In the USA, they don't care about MMR, it's the mercury in the vehicle, thimerosal, that they're concerned about. And no doubt in other countries, they're worried about something else in vaccination. But the fact is, in the Denmark study, MMR was used in the 1970s, was introduced in the 1970s, but the increase didn't occur until the 1990s. Thermosol they took out of the vaccines because of the American uh, concern for it in uh, the 1990s, but the incidence is unchanged. It had no uh, impact at all. So I think it's safe to say vaccination is a red herring. Even though your child has been vaccinated three weeks later, it's a, distance, it's a coincidence. It's now a fairly common uh, condition. It's almost 1% now. So the question is, and so there will be coincidences when you have a common condition, why is it 15-fold increased in, since 1990? And I think there's lots of reasons for that. Uh, one is that the diagnostic criteria broadened enormously. The other is people are much more attuned to autism than they were. I mean, parents know about it, teachers know about it, doctors know about it, and so on. And so that's a big feature. Another one is in the 1990s in America, they provided education, special educational support if your child had autism. Well, that brought the autistic kids you know, out of the houses and everybody said, you know, my kid's autistic, I want remedial education and uh, speech therapy and all the extras for the child, which is what the child needs. So that in itself would greatly increase the instance. And as a result of that, uh, at least in part, stigma more or less disappeared. Now that you can sequence the protein coding parts of a genome, at least cheaply, for probably $10,000, American dollars now, um, you know, you can do hundreds, thousands of individuals with a condition you're interested in, and you will find, I almost certainly, you will find increased number of these big effect genes. Now, once you have a big effect gene, now you can go into an animal model like a mouse and see if you can model uh, the disease. You don't have to model the whole thing, but even if you model a bit of it, uh, and then try to understand in the mouse, uh, or the fly, or the worm, or the zebrafish, what's the underlying neural basis of this problem. You can find out what areas of the brain, what cell types, what synapses, what circuits, and so on. Now, once you've done that, how do you get back to the human to try to find out if the same cells, the same synapses, the same regions are relevant? So one way now that has been provided is that you can make these induced pluripotent stem cells. You can take a fibroblast from your mouse model and make something that looks like embryonic stem cells. You can now induce them to become various kinds of neurons. So once you know what kind of neuron, what kind of synapse and so on you need, you can make them from induced pluripotent stem cells. Because Developmental neurobiologists have figured out how to get many different types of neurons. Once you've done that, then you can reconstruct the synapses and the circuits in a culture dish or in a developing mouse brain to show that you can reproduce the physiological defect that you found in your mouse mutant. Uh, and now you're ready to go back to the human. Because in the human, it's just as easy to make these induced pluripotent stem cells. From the studies you've done in the mouse, it tells you how you would want to treat your induced pluripotent stem cells to get the types of neurons you think are relevant. And now you go to the human with the same mutation with autism, you make induced pluripotent stem cells, lots of people are doing that. What they're not doing is doing all this work in the mouse and then the mouse induced pluripotent stem cells to tell you how to get there. But once you've done that, now you know what to do with the human induce pluripotent stem cells with the same mutation and try to see if you can get synapses with the physiological defect you identified in the mouse. Then you can try to screen for drugs that fix the problem and see if it actually fixes the problem in the mouse and the problem in the human. This was not possible even a few years ago. So this is, in my way, a dramatic way of getting at the neural basis of these fascinating diseases, and they're going to tell us an enormous amount about the normal human brain.